Hello, and welcome to this episode of A Cancer Conversation with the Georgia Cancer Center at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation. My name is Chris Curry, and I am your host for this podcast series. I work at the Georgia Cancer Center as the manager for communications and marketing. Today's conversation will be with Dr. Kelly Homler, who serves as the associate professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Dr. Homler, thank you for joining me for today's conversation. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. So today's topic is going to be about uh, sarcoma slash bone cancer. July is sarcoma slash bone cancer awareness, and this is an area where you are uh, a subject matter expert, so we wanted to take some time to have this conversation, have this discussion with you about this topic. Let's begin by sharing a little bit of information about who you are working at uh, Augusta University Health, the Georgia Cancer Center. Can you talk a little bit about what led you to pursue a career in treating these kinds of cancers? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as far back as I can remember, um, even as a kid, I knew I wanted to do medicine. Um, and so as I progressed along, um, I was exposed, you know, I was an athlete growing up. I was exposed to multiple uh, musculoskeletal injuries, and I was fascinated by that. Had a few of my own, and so I was kind of drawn to orthopedic surgery. Um, and then, you know, even when I was in a, a senior in high school, I was able to spend time with an orthopedic surgeon there, kind of confirming my desire to do that. And it wasn't really until um, residency that I was exposed to orthopedic oncology. You know, most of us think about orthopedics, break a bone, fix it, traumas, things like that. Uh, but orthopedic oncology uh, was a field I had never seen before. And I remember doing a, a rotation. I was terrified, didn't know anything about it. And yeah. so... Um, as I started to learn about it and see the patients and the problems, um, I really enjoyed it. Um, and so, it, it, you know, for me, it was sort of like putting uh, a puzzle together. You see a patient, you get a history, you get some imaging, you get pathology, and everything kind of comes together. There's a little bit more thought than there is in a lot of the other aspects of orthopedics. And you really get more um, continuity of care uh, with patients than we do in most of the other fields of orthopedics. We really talk a lot about at the Cancer Center and Augusta University Health that um, that sort of theme of the multidisciplinary care approach to a patient's cancer care where they're looking, where you're getting input from different areas, different departments. So good to know that that carries into orthopedics. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and most orthopedics, you don't have that really, but for us, it's a, it's a big team with medical oncology and radiation oncology and plastics. There's a, there's a bunch of people that you work together to take care of these patients, and it's really rewarding um, to have that experience. So some people, a lot of people maybe, don't necessarily know what sarcoma is. What is sarcoma? That's a good question. Most people don't know much about sarcoma. You know, so <laughs> sarcoma is a cancer of the connective tissues. And, uh, you know, if you look at the, all the cancers in the United States and, and you put it on a bar graph, you know, like, uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer is way up here, and then way down below and way off to the side of the chart are sarcomas because they're extremely rare. You know, soft tissue sarcomas are about 8 per 100,000 people, and uh, bone sarcomas are 1 per 100,000 people. Um, but I like to explain it to patients. You know, I, I like to put cancers into three broad categories. You know, there's the organ cancers, the carcinomas, things like breast cancer, lung cancer, prostate. Everybody's heard of that, Right. Uh, second category, the blood cancers, hematopoietic cancers, things like leukemia, lymphoma, myeloma. People have also heard of that. Mm -hmm. And then the third category is sarcoma, which most people have never heard about. So, again, a cancer of the connective tissue, so it can be bone, cartilage, nerve, fat, muscle, fibrous tissue, all those things have a cancer variety. And it's interesting because they, they behave very differently. You know, the organ cancers, the carcinomas, tend to spread through the lymph nodes. Okay. Um, sarcomas tend to not spread through the lymph nodes, only about 5 to 7%. Most of them spread through the bloodstream. Um, oh, really? They first end up in the lungs. And so uh, it's definitely a different category uh, that most people really have never heard of or known anybody with. Yeah, let's talk a little bit more about those different types of sarcomas that you were referencing. Yeah, so there's lots of different types of sarcomas, <laughs> right? So I think the most recent World Health Organization classification has at least 70, 70 different types of sarcomas. 70? Yeah, and That's honestly, a lot. As pathology becomes more refined, we're, we're learning more and more. You know, this is actually one of the hardest areas, I think, for pathologists to make a diagnosis, which is one of the, the troublesome things for patients because it takes longer to make a diagnosis than it does in, in other uh, types of cancers. You know, they used to look at it on the microscope and just give it a name based on its appearance. Now they do a bunch of staining, immunohistochemical, 
And then now they moved on to genetics. And I think the more that we learn, especially with genetics, the more types we're, we're finding in sarcoma. So it's, it's ever expanding. Okay. And is that, is that genetic testing? Like, is that sort of normal genetic testing or what is, what sort of genetics? So just molecular testing that they do in next generation sequencing. Um, but you know, we usually, in terms, there's 70 different types. We usually treat the majority of them the same. The biggest difference is between bone sarcomas and soft tissue sarcomas. We do treat those very differently. You know, bone sarcomas, um, you know, the three most common are, are Ewing sarcoma, osteosarcoma, chondrosarcoma. Um, two of those occur in teenagers, and those typically are treated with, you know, chemotherapy, surgery, and then chemotherapy again. Soft tissue sarcomas are different. No matter really what the subtype, uh, the treatment usually involves radiation surgery, okay. plus or minus chemotherapy, okay. depending on the type. How do you sarcoma patients present? What, what, what do you see? What do they experience? Yeah, that's a good question. So again, bone and soft tissue tend to present very differently. So bone sarcomas, uh, patients tend to present with pain. You know, cancer in the bone, no matter if it has spread from somewhere else or started in the bone, typically is pain. And so when I'm teaching other providers, you know, the red flags for bone pain, it's usually um, pain at rest. So most orthopedic injuries is pain with activity, you know, rotator cuff, bursitis. But pain, even when you're just sitting there, uh, it's pain that progressively gets worse over time and pain that will even waken somebody up out of a deep sleep. Oh, wow. And so when people hear those things, you know, it should, it should be red flags that this could be something worse. Yeah. Now, soft tissue sarcomas, on the other hand, um, typically aren't painful. And that's one reason people get... Um, uh, these sarcomas get very big. Referring providers, they just show up with a lump or a bump, and they say, well, it's been there for a while. It's getting bigger, but it doesn't hurt. And so a lot of people assume it's a lipoma, um, don't really get it worked up. And so one of the big things I try to teach people is that sarcomas typically are not painful. There are some nerve tumors um, that are, but most are not. Mm -hmm. So, and I, and I also try to teach referring uh, providers that essentially anything that's larger than a golf ball in the upper thighs or the upper arms really should be considered a sarcoma until proven otherwise. And so a lot of times that means their physician should get, you know, additional imaging. Uh, and on the same token, anything larger than a marble in the hands or the feet really should be considered a sarcoma until proven otherwise. Uh, unfortunately, about a third of my patients um, are incompletely excised sarcomas or whoops procedures. So those are like unplanned, unplanned resections. And that obviously, when we have to go back and treat those, it comes with additional morbidity. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the referring physicians, because I we've talked a little bit about that before on this podcast with different providers. We have a really great physician outreach sort of network of referring providers. How important is that for you to educate those referring providers about sarcomas and what to look for and what to spot and what to tell patients? Yeah, I think it's huge, especially in an area that's rare. You know, a lot of people in their career may come across just a handful, and so they're not they're not really attuned to the thing. So the fact it's a mass, it's not painful. The other um, <clears throat> common thing we see is they'll get imaging, and uh, they expect, just like breast or lung, for the cancer to look aggressive or spiculated on, on imaging, and sarcomas really don't. They're, they're usually well encapsulated. They kind of fill the muscle compartment, and it just looks like fusiform, football-shaped. And so a lot of times they're like, well, it doesn't look aggressive. It's probably okay. So I think the education is important, and forming those alliances is important, too. You know? And so the more uh, outreach we have with other orthopedic surgeons and general surgeons and family medicine, all of those folks... Um, it allows us to get patients in quicker, make a diagnosis, and start treatment quicker. Okay, good. Uh, you said that bone and sar soft tissue sarcomas are treated differently. Let's start with bone. What is the typical treatment for a bone sarcoma? Yes, again, most bone sarcomas, it's a combination of chemotherapy, and then there's a surgery, and then chemotherapy. Um, you know, so unfortunately, a lot of our bone sarcomas, um, osteosarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, occur in teenagers. Um, and those do uh, have the chemo, surgery, chemo. There's one variety, interestingly enough, chondrosarcoma, that doesn't respond very well to chemotherapy or radiation. It tends to be a slower dividing tumor, and they actually occur in, in older patients. And so those patients are, are a little bit different that it's, it's surgery only. It's wide resection. Um, but for the others, it's usually chemotherapy, surgery, and chemotherapy. And when we talk about surgery, it's usually involved, it's, it's resecting the entire segment of bone that's involved. Uh, so it's not going inside and, and debulking, but it's really taking out the top third of the femur and doing a complex, you know, hip replacement or, or something along those lines. Okay. All right. Um, now, how about soft tissue sarcoma? Yeah, so soft tissue sarcoma is a little different. Um, um, pretty much every soft tissue sarcoma, despite the name, is treated with um, surgery 
in radiation. And you can do radiation before or after. We tend to do radiation before. It's a little bit lower dose before surgery than it is after surgery. And so the, the most common thing would be to get radiation. It's usually about five weeks worth of radiation. You have about four to six weeks to let the skin heal. And then it's uh, surgery, wide resection. And so again, we make the diagnosis and then at the time of surgery, we don't want to see tumor at all. We really want to take a, a cuff of normal muscle, you know, mm -hmm. around it. Mm -hmm. um, I know that, you know, there's always advances in um, cancer treatment, cancer surgery, surgical techniques, et cetera. What have you seen in the treatment of sarcoma during your career? What sort of changes? Yeah, I think the biggest, um, probably started a little bit before my career, but obviously the advent of CT and MRI was one of the biggest things for the surgical treatment of, of sarcomas. It used to be that anybody with a cancer in their extremities had an amputation. You know, these days it's about a 90 to 95% limb salvage rate. And that's because CT and MRI gives us a, a good idea of the anatomy, exactly where the tumor is, you know, if it's close to a nerve or a vessel. And so most of the time we can save the limb. Uh, and now technology has gone forward where we can fuse CTs and MRIs and see where the tumor is, spin it in three-dimensional. We can get, um, you know, cadaver bone that's matched, uh, and we can lay it on top of the, what we plan on taking out. Um, we, have, we can make 3D printed custom cutting guides to make sure we're making precise cuts on the patient's bone, taking that out, and then doing the same cutting guide on the cadaver bone and putting that back in its place. So mm -hmm. technology is, has is, uh, really advanced a lot in terms of the surgical treatment. Chemotherapy, not so much. We're still using a lot of the old chemotherapy regimens, and so I think this next phase with next-generation sequencing, we're really looking for uh, possibilities of more targeted chemotherapy. Are there any clinical trials currently underway that you know about or that are, that are exciting? So there's always a few clinical trials, but again, with it being so rare, there's, there's so much less than, than other fields. But okay. of course, our medical oncology colleagues are, are all on those. And so if we, if we have a patient, obviously, I don't do the chemotherapy portion right, of it. Right. And so, you know, we refer it over to our sarcoma medical um, oncologist and they help organize that. Okay, great. Um, let's see. Is there a difference in how uh, bone and soft tissue sarcomas are diagnosed or are just different in general when it comes to pediatric versus adult patients? Not really for um, pediatric, pediatric and adult. It's, it's about the same. It's the same workup. We get usually, you know, plain x-rays, advanced imaging, and then there's a biopsy. Um, you know, with uh, pediatric patients, you know, obviously sometimes the procedure is a little overwhelming, so sometimes we have to use sedation for an MRI or for the biopsy. Uh, but for the most part, the, the process is the same. And what about the treatments? Same. Okay. All right. Um, if someone schedules an appointment with you, what should they expect the first time they meet you? What, what is that first appointment like? Yeah, so it's a lot of information all at one time. So I, <laughs> <laughs> so I tell patients it's sort of like a, that's our fact-finding mission. You know, a lot of times they've already seen one, two, several providers before they come. And so we're gathering up, you know, clinic notes. We ask them to bring a disc so we can have all their imaging. Um, so we're looking through all of that. We're, we're getting a good history. We're doing a good physical exam. We look at all the imaging. Uh, and then we have to plan for what do we do next. And usually that involves um, doing additional imaging. So we've got to get good images of wherever the mass is. Mm -hmm. um, and then we stage. So we're looking at them from head to toe and see has it spread anywhere else. And so a lot of times for us, that's a CT scan of their chest and a, and a, and a PET CT. Um, and then we do the biopsy. So once that, all that imaging is done, we coordinate with a biopsy. Most are done through a core needle biopsy. So our interventional radiologist does that. It's uh, less contamination going through the tissue with um, a needle as opposed to doing it surgically like we used to. And so I'll work with the um, radiologist. We look at the images. We talk about the approach. So it's important for us how the biopsy is done. So for referring providers, we always tell them the person who does the biopsy should be the person who's going to do the definitive surgery okay. uh, because where the biopsy is really needs to be in line with where we plan to do our incision. Okay. And so it does take some coordination with the radiologist. Um, they do the biopsy, and usually it takes about six to ten days to get the result back. Again, okay. pathology for sarcoma is really challenging for the pathologist, and so it, it's a bit of a process, and so I try to prepare patients for that anxiety-provoking period because it is – you know, yeah. they just want an answer. First and foremost, they just want to know what's the, what's the diagnosis, yes, which yes. sometimes takes a while to get to. Um, what is it like for you working with patients? What does it mean to be their partner in, in their care? Yeah, I love it. You know, so I do uh, orthopedic oncology, and, and part of it, I also do joint replacement, right? And I love both, but my true calling is orthopedic oncology. You know, I just love working with patients. They come to you in such a vulnerable time. 
Uh, they trust you to take care of this really difficult issue. And you get to know patients so well. You know, it's like I said, continuity of care. We don't see that that much in orthopedics. But for us, we're following these patients for 10 years. And so I've been to 50th wedding anniversaries and retirement parties. And you get oh, to know wow. these patients really well. And it's and it's super fun. You know, they've survived a cancer. They're, they're living their life. And, and you've gotten to know them well over those years. Yeah. Um, what about side effects? Are there any... Uh, side effects from treatments, from surgery, from chemotherapy, from radiation that, that people should be aware of? For sure. So, of course, um, you know, chemotherapy, we have to do it, has its own side effects. Mm -hmm. um, you know, medical oncologists will tell you more about that. You know, radiation, for the most part, is fairly well to tolerated. There's, um, once you get up to the doses that we use for sarcoma, they are pretty high doses. The most common things we see are things like sunburns, blistering initially. You may have some just kind of pain in that area, but for the most part, well tolerated. Uh, we worry a little bit more about the late effects. So, um, you know, radiation in the long term can cause some scarring of the muscle, can damage the blood supply to the bones. We have to be on the lookout for stress fractures in the bones, even, you know, 10 years down the road. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the fear would be, you know, a second cancer in the area of the, the prior radiation. So it all comes with um, side effects, but, you know, with the goal of curing cancer. Of course, the surgical part just depends on where it is. You know, some places are more favorable for a great outcome. You know, we can take out the end of the femur bone, do a complex knee replacement, and, and, and people do pretty well. Uh, if you've got a soft tissue sarcoma in the thigh, sometimes we have to take out the entire, you know, quadriceps muscle. So part of that visit, um, that pre-op visit, is really talking about, okay, so here's what we have to take out. Here's what that's going to mean for you, and this is what I would expect your function to be after surgery. And that's a, it's a, it's a big deal. Are there common questions that patients ask you during this procedure, during this sort of workup, this fact-finding, um, getting ready for surgery? Uh, what common questions do you hear, and how do you answer them? So many questions. I don't even know where to begin. <laughs> Obviously, the biggest question when they come in is, um, what, what is the diagnosis? Like, what is this? Yeah. What is a sarcoma? What does that mean? Um, and then they just want to know, okay, so now we know what it is. What are we going to do? How do I get started on treatment as quickly as possible? Yeah. So we kind of lay out the treatment plan. And then a lot of times they, they actually see me and then they go away for a while, whether it be for chemotherapy or radiation. And then okay. they come back after that and we kind of look look them over again head to toe and we kind of have that surgical discussion. Okay, so we've talked a little bit, but now let's drill down on here, here's what we have to take out. Here's what we expect your function will be and really get into that surgical thing. So they've got questions um, really through every step of the process. And of course, the long term is just, you know, how, what, what's my function going to be long term? And there's always the question of how likely is it to come back? How likely to spread? And, it, and it's hard to group them all together with so many. But, you know, most bones, bone and soft tissue sarcomas, the, the rate of it coming back is somewhere around 15%. And that's with, you know, the best treatment, wide, wide margins. 15% okay. may still try to come back, which yeah. is why we follow them for 10 years. And uh, up to 20% may try to spread. And again, if they ever spread, typically to the lungs. And so okay. that is why we, we follow patients very carefully. Okay. Well, Dr. Hommler, I appreciate your time today and, and being part of this conversation and joining me and sharing this important information with those who may be watching or listening today. Um, if you have any questions, you can certainly send them to us. Uh, cancer at Augusta.edu is our email address. We can share them with Dr. Homler, and we'll get those answers to you. Um, otherwise, please uh, subscribe, like, and uh, review us. Let us know how we're doing, and uh, thank you for your time today.